All right, everybody good? Great. Hey, uh, it's going to be a good week, man. It's going to be awesome. I'm excited you guys are here. So if I hadn't met you yet, my name's Spencer. I've been working here for a really long time. Uh, so this, this morning we're going to be talking about, is Jesus the only way? Which, to be real, there are a lot of different ways we could go with this breakout. We could talk about, does the idea of Jesus make sense more than other gods? We can talk about how do we know, you know, proofs for Christianity. But what we're talking about this morning is, basically, can there be multiple ways to God? Is, is really what we're talking about. Like, is it possible that everybody who is faithful in any religion, is it possible that they're all going to heaven? Can there, is Jesus the only way, or is he just one way? And really, what we're thinking about is... <laughs> Isn't it narrow-minded and arrogant for Christians to say Jesus is the only way? I mean, you think about it, that's cutting out all other people from all other religions in all other parts of the world. Because what the world thinks about you, if you're a Christian, is that you are arrogant and narrow-minded. Because you say, I've got the only way and everybody else is wrong. So, is that what we're saying? And so, uh, let me pray real quick and we'll dive right in. Jesus Thanks for these guys and girls, and I pray this is a fruitful week at camp, and Lord, that you would guard and guide what I say right now. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. So, we live in a unique time in history where our culture is very individualized. Like, everything that you have, like, in, like never before in history, can be tailor-made to you. You know, like now you can... With Nike ID, you can tailor make your shoes to you. You can even decide what color. You can put your own name on them. You know, you think about every restaurant has one of those uh, freestyle Coke things where you can tailor make your drink. Even every ad that you see on the side of your browsers, they're all tailor made to you. You get different ads than I do based on what you search for. And so, man, we live in a culture that's very individualized, which is cool. And we also live in a culture that's very diverse which means you go to school with people that don't look like you, and that is good. That's right. You go to school with people that uh, their culture is not the same as you, that they may not even speak the same language as you, and that's cool. Cultural diversity is beautiful. That's great. But with our culture being so individualized, like you get whatever you want, and our culture being so diverse, which are two things we're like, great, that's those, both, th- both those things are beautiful. One of the problems is that we'd start to lump a lot of weird things in there, and we'd say, so, since everybody's their own individual and everybody's different, you can, you can act however you want to act. You can love whoever you want to love. You can worship whoever you want to worship. And now we would say that one is free to worship whoever they want to worship, but our culture's taking it one further and saying, all religions, all belief systems are equally true. They're equally valid, and you can't discriminate against somebody else's belief. They'll say, our men, the main mantra of our culture is, you can't judge somebody else. You can't say what anybody else believes is wrong. So that's why it's so unpopular when Christians say, Jesus is the only way. So a lot of Christians have started saying things like, uh, well, Jesus is the right way for me but maybe he's not the right way for you. Or maybe they'll say things like this. Well, Jesus is the right way, but maybe he lets people from all religions come to himself. Maybe if they're faithful in their own religion. So what I want to look at to answer this question, is Jesus the only way or can there be a bunch of ways? I want to look at the nature of truth. Basically, how does truth work? Because I think we're confusing some things when we say all religions are all equally true. They're all equally right. I think we're confusing some things. Okay, so when y'all are in school, y'all have talked about subjective versus objective, right? Everybody's covered that. Subjective is preference. Objective is truth. Now, that's a hard thing to explain, so maybe I can illustrate it a little bit better, give you an example. All right, so I want you to tell me, is this a subjective preference statement, or is this an objective truth statement? Is it true just for me, or is it true for everybody? What if I were to say this? My favorite food is fried chicken. Is that subjective or objective? All right, there's a lot of different uh, opinions there, but this is subjective. This is true for me, and it really is. My favorite food is fried chicken, hands down. But it's true for me, but it might not be true for you. 
You see, whatever anybody chooses as their favorite food, that's okay. That's good for you, but it might not be good for me. That's the way preference, that's the way subjective truth works. Maybe it's good for me, maybe it's not good. Maybe it's true for me, but not true for you. All right, let's look at this next one. What about this? Two plus two equals four. Is that subjective preference or objective truth? Objective, objective truth, right? This is not, this can't be, well, that's true for me. But for you, maybe two plus two equals six. That's not the way truth works, right? So there's a big difference between subjective, what's true for just me, and objective, what's true for everybody. Because no matter what you think about 2 plus 2, it equals 4, even if you're wrong. I know this because I'm, uh, I'm colorblind. Not all the way. Like, not everybody's wearing gray right now, just most of you. I'm just kidding. But, uh, like, for me, I have trouble with uh, mainly green but sometimes red. So I did buy a pair of pink shoes not long ago. Thinking, so if I'm wearing all green one day, just nod and wave or whatever, because I have no clue. I think it's gray or blue or brown, right? And so no matter what I think about a color, there's an objective truth that's outside of me. Does that make sense? All right, so let me give you a couple more just to practice, because it's going to come in really crucial when we start talking about can all religions be true, all right? This one's a little bit harder. Is this subjective or objective? It's cold in here. Objective. All right, there's some different opinions. This is subjective because it may be cold in here to me, but it might not be cold in here to you. It could be true for me, but not true for you. What about this statement? It's 68 degrees in here. Is that subjective or is it objective? Objective, objective right? That is true or it's not true for everybody. It's not like, well, it's 68 for me, but for you it's 72, right? That's objective truth. So getting a solid understanding of the nature of truth and how truth works is really important when you start to look at questions about can all these religions be true at the same time? Because what people are saying now is there are many ways to God. What, what they're saying is basically picture a mountain and a mountaintop. You know, you might have multiple paths to get up this mountain, but the end goal is the same place, right? I've heard uh, other people tell this illustration. They'll say, you know, all religions, they're really seeing the same thing, but, they, but not fully. And they use an illustration, this story, you've probably heard it before, about some blind men finding an elephant. Have you all heard this story before? Where there's some blind men out in the woods or out in the jungle, and they happen upon an elephant. And someone is, uh, is asking them to describe it. And one man is at the elephant's tail, and he's like, an elephant is like a rope. It's flexible, it's long, it's, it's slender, it's like a rope. And the next guy's like, no, an elephant's not like a rope. He's touching the elephant's leg, and he's like, an elephant's like a tree. An elephant's strong and thick, not, not like a rope at all. And a third guy's like, no, an elephant's like a, like a weapon, like a spear, pointy, because he's standing at the tusks. And what the, the way the story goes is, <clears throat> you see, all these guys are really, they're describing the same elephant. They're only seeing a part of it. And they'll say, so all religions are like this. Every religion has a piece of the truth. They're all describing the same sacred reality. They're just describing their portion that they see. And where things seem to be contradictory, you can't see the whole picture. Now, to be honest, if you just think about that illustration, it sounds beautiful. It really does. Oh, man, everybody's seeking truth. Until you stop and think about <clears throat> the nature of truth and how truth works. Because truth, by definition, is narrow. Objective truth is really narrow. Two plus two equals what? Four. Y'all are narrow-minded. You're going to tell me two plus two equals four and not six or seven or 1,176? Like, you're going you're gonna to cut out all other numbers and just say two plus two. The only thing that's right is this one. Y'all are narrow-minded. Well, that's not being narrow-minded. That's just how truth works. Truth is narrow. Objective truth is a narrow, narrow thing. That's how truth works. Because in reality, when you start looking at the different religions, there are a lot of contradictions within these religions. People that say all religions are true, stop, you got to stop and think about the contradictions. Think about just what religions will say about Jesus. To Hindus, Jesus is a good man, a teacher, even an avatar of Vishnu. To Buddhists, Jesus is a bodhisattva, a figure of great compassion who stepped out of nirvana to enlighten humans. 
to Muslims. Jesus was a prophet like Muhammad. He was born of a virgin. He worked miracles, but he never died. The Christians, Jesus is son of God, the second person of the Trinity. He died for our rescue and he rose again. To atheists, Jesus was just a guy or maybe nobody. So when you think about this, man, all of these religions disagree on who Jesus is. And there's about a billion other things that these religions would say, no, we're not the same on those things. About a billion other things these religions would disagree on. They all make exclusive truth claims. And here's how exclusive truth claims work, all right? We're going to put the illustration of this, the degrees back on the board. I want you to think about this. Exclusive truth claims work like this. What about these statements? It's 68 degrees in here and... It's 78 degrees in here. If you have two people saying these statements, what are our options? Our options are one is true and one is false. It's 68 degrees in here, so it cannot be 78. Or it's 78, so it cannot be 68. Or maybe they're both wrong. Maybe it's 62 degrees in here and both of them are false. But they can't both be true. Does that make sense? Maybe it's one or the other or it's neither, but it can't be both at the same time. That's the way exclusive truth claims work. So let's think about this in the context of religions. What about these statements? Islam says Jesus did not die. Christianity said Jesus died. Our options are the same because we're talking about truth. One can be true and one can be false, or maybe they're both false, but they can't both be true at the same time. They're saying completely opposite things. They can't both be true. Jesus died and he didn't die. So when you really start thinking about the differences between religions, it can't be that all religions are looking at different parts of the same elephant. Even that illustration, if you really start thinking about it, because that illustration sounds so beautiful that everybody is just seeing a part of the divine truth. And if we'd all just see it's really love and faith that binds us all, it sounds beautiful, but when you start thinking about how truth works, it, it really breaks down, right? Because even the person that's telling the story is claiming to be outside of these people and seeing the situation clearly. It's more like this. We have a guy that's coming out in the jungle. Who is the guy that's seeing everything so clearly? Who is the one that says, all religions are blind, but I, I alone can see the truth that they're all the same? None of these religions would agree to that. You see, that's just as narrow-minded as someone saying Christianity is the right way. This man is saying, I have the right way. They're all the same. And so, you know, while Christians have to have good answers for their faith, skeptics have to realize there's faith within their reasoning as well, within their questioning. So, again, it's a nice thought that all religions can lead to the same place, but based on the nature of truth, it can't be true. Objective truth does not work like that, and everyone, deep down, everyone knows it. So then the question becomes, if they can't all be true, because, okay, pause, let me give you a quick definition. This idea that all religions can lead to the same place is called pluralism, or you can have plural, multiple ways to God, all right? And based on the nature of truth, it can't happen. <clears throat> so the question then becomes, well, which one's right then? If all these guys say different things about Jesus and different things about the world, which one is right? So the question isn't which religion is absolutely 100% provable because none of them are. None of them can you go and say this is 100% provable. The question really is which one's the most probable? Which worldview or which religion makes the most sense of the world around us? So uh, there's a guy named Tim Keller, and he came up with four things talking about making sense of the world around us. He says this, no matter what religion we're in, no matter what worldview we're in, number one, we all have a sense that the world is not the way it should be. Everybody in every religion realizes, dang, there's something screwed up with the world. Y'all look at the news, you see what's going on now, people killing each other, that racism, tons of things where you're like, this is not right. It is not the way the world should be. And people in every religion realize the world is messed up. The second thing is, we all have a sense that we also are messed up, that we are very flawed. Everybody's got to admit there's something wrong with the world, but if you're honest with yourself, you've got to admit there's something wrong in here too. 
Why do I keep doing the stuff I don't want to do? Why do I think thoughts like that? Why do I act like that sometimes? We have to admit there's not only something wrong with the world, but there's something wrong inside. We all have a sense that we are very flawed and at the same time very great in that we're destined for something better. We're destined for, some, destined for something greater. We all long for greatness. Number three, <clears throat> we all have a longing for love and for beauty that nothing in this world can fulfill. You ever think about that? People in every religion prize love and prize beauty. Where does that come from? People in every worldview uh, love beautiful things and prize love. What, what does it mean for an atheist? You think about if that person you think you really love, if you really believe that they're just a random collection of atoms, then love loses all its meaning. I love you, you random collection of chaos and atoms. We know that love's more than that. We know it means more than that, that it's deeper than that. So we have these longings, we have these realizations that the world is screwed up and we inside are screwed up, but we long to be great. We long for something greater. We have this longing for love and beauty that nothing in the world can fulfill. And the reason we have longings is because they're linked to something real. In a little while, you're going to have hunger. And the reason you have hunger is because food exists. It's real. You're going to get thirsty. And the reason you have thirst is because it's linked to something real. It's, it's linked to water. So the reason we have longings for love and beauty and meaning and purpose is because those things exist. <clears throat> every religion, every worldview has to answer these four questions. If you think about it, no matter what the worldview is, they have to answer all four of these questions, all right? <clears throat> Number one, every religion or every worldview has to answer the question of origin. Where did we come from? Every religion has to have a solid answer for this. How did all of this start? Even if it's non-religion, even if it's atheism, they have to have an answer for origin. The second uh, question that, that every religion has to answer is the question of meaning. Why are we here? Their first one is origin. How do we get here? The second one is meaning. Why are we here? Why do you exist? Every person thinks about this deep down. Number three, every worldview has to answer the question of morality. What I mean by that, <clears throat> we all believe that it's wrong to punch someone in the face. Why? Every culture, if you punch someone in the face, they get mad. Why? Why do we all share this common right and wrong? Ever think about that? <clears throat> and then the other half of the question of morality is, what do we do with the wrong we all perceive in the, in the world and perceive in ourselves? What do we do with our own sin? What do we do with our badness? <clears throat> the last question is origin, meaning, morality. And the last question that every worldview has to answer is destiny. What's next? Where are we going? What happens when you die? <clears throat> every worldview, every religion has to an answer these questions. Where do we come from? Why are we here? <clears throat> Why does everybody have a concept of right and wrong? And where are we going? Now, we don't have time in this breakout to go on every religion's take on each one of these. So let's just look, just real quick as an example, let's just look at two of them. Origin. <clears throat> what are all the religions take on origin? Because some of them don't make sense at all. Some of, some of the religions, you can stop right here because they have a nonsense version of uh, where did we come from. Even atheism, which really that's their claim to fame, is they claim we know how everything began. But if you start thinking about it, how do they claim everything began? There was a ball of matter. And one day, it exploded. Well, there's questions even in that. Where did the ball of matter come from? Who created that? And what was it sitting in? Where did the empty space come from that the ball of matter was in? And if a ball of matter exploded, where did empty space come from? Where did time come from? Where did the matter come from in the beginning? How does this ball of matter exploding account for the complexity of your DNA? How does the ball of matter exploding count for the interdependence of species? Why do trees exist that need bees and bees exist that need those same trees while we also need the bees and the trees? See what I'm saying? Every species is interdependent on each other. How do they account for that? You think about <clears throat> the Big Bang can't account for things like love. 
Why do we all have this longing for beauty and love? So there's other religions that can't account for origin, like Buddhism. If you think some slices of Buddhists will say, uh, the, if you ask the question, where did we come from? They'll say, well, nothing really exists, so, you know. But we all know that's not a solid answer. And so some Buddhists will deviate from that answer and they'll say, okay, well, things exist, but it just all started spontaneously. Wow! Everything just, boom, just go. Well, that's a nonsense version of how did everything start. Now, other religions will have a great answer for origin, like Islam. Islam has a fantastic creation story. It was great, but they don't have a solid answer for morality. What do you do with the fact that there is wrong in the world? How do you pay for that? How do you, how do you deal with the fact that the world is screwed up and we're screwed up? I went two months ago, I think it was, to, to listen to an imam speak. Uh, uh, imam's like a, a Muslim holy man. And folks were asking him questions. And he was talking about the five pillars of Islam and kind of what he does day to day. And someone said, how do you get to paradise? And he mentioned the five pillars. And uh, he, he basically said at the end, well, in reality, my good has to outweigh my bad. And the person asking the question said, how you doing with that? Because we all have to admit, if we're honest with ourselves, our good never outweighs our bad. We all, we're screwed up. And so every religion is in the system of how do we pay for our sins? You know, that's why with, with Buddhists, they believe their, their good behavior and their, their empty minds will enlighten them and level them up life after life after life after life, either paying for their sins or being rewarded for their good until they reach nirvana, the state of, of enlightenment. For a Hindu, every rebirth is a reward or a punishment for a previous life. What were they paying for in their first life? And you think about the heart is desperately wicked, and no other religion has a solid answer for what do we do about that except for Christianity. Christianity is so unique because it has a solid answer for every one of these questions, for origin, for meaning, for morality, and for destiny. What does Christianity do with sin? It acknowledges our good can never outweigh our bad. That's why Jesus came and gave us his goodness and took away our badness. Forgiveness is so unique to Christ. It makes sense of the world around us because we know that we can't pay for our, for our own sins. Christianity has a logical answer for origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. It's the only worldview with a solid answer for all four. So, thinking about proof for religions and knowing that none of them can be absolutely provable. There's a story about a, a Russian astronaut. He went up into space, and when he came back, he said, I went into space looking for God, but I didn't ever see him, so he must not exist. And C.S. Lewis, an author, he was talking about this, and he's like, well, that's ridiculous. Of course you're not going to just fly up in space and pass God. You know, like, he's not a character in a story. That would be like a character in a story going up in the book, going up in the attic and looking for the author. It'd be like if you read Harry Potter books, it'd be like Harry Potter going up into his attic to try to find J.K. Rowling, the lady that wrote the books. He's like, that's ridiculous. You can't see the author as a character in the book. You can only learn about the author, what she chooses to reveal of herself within the book. And so what we're saying with this is basically Christians don't claim to be able to prove everything, Right? But we do believe that Christianity, the creation, the fall, redemption, restoration, that it makes the most sense of the world we live in, that God has left us clues so that we can see the author even written into the story. And if we believe the God of the Bible, these clues make sense. Creation makes sense. Complexity, design, morality, the laws of nature, beauty, love, redemption, restoration, and hope. Man, the God of the Bible accounts for all of these. All right, so... Can there be multiple ways to God? Well, the nature of truth does not allow that. All right? The idea of Christianity seems to make the most sense of, of the world around us. But there's one more twist I want to talk about, which is some folks will say, okay, okay, so Jesus is the only way. That's fine. But do, people, do all people actually have to believe in him? Or is it just the kind of thing where Jesus died, and if you're faithful in your religion, Jesus' death is just like a blanket, like it'll just cover everybody as long as they have faith in something? That's a good question. It's a, it's a really legitimate question. So I want to look at the Bible and see what it has to say about this. 
John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. That means nobody comes to God except through Jesus. Acts 4, 12. There's salvation in no one else. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That means nobody can be saved except through Jesus. John 10, 9. I'm the door. If anyone enters by me, he'll be saved and go in and out and find pasture. That means one enters into salvation through Jesus alone. 1 Corinthians 15. For as by man came death, by man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. That says only those who belong to Christ will be made alive. And the last one, 1 Timothy 2.5. There is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. That means Jesus is the only go-between for man and God. But people could still read these verses and be like, oh, all that says is Jesus is the only way. It doesn't say every person individually has to believe. What about people that are faithful in their own religion? So let's look at a few more. Romans 3. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. That means the whole world is accountable for their sins. So then he gives the remedy. Verse 20. By the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Pause. That means by doing good, nobody's going to make it there. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness or the goodness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. Verse 22. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. This verse says all are accountable to God for the law and the goodness, the righteousness of God is available for all who believe through faith in Jesus. So only those who believe in Jesus specifically belong to Jesus. Here it is again, the most famous verse in the Bible, John three sixteen. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It's very clear. And then he goes on to explain it. Because God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that, in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever doesn't believe is condemned already because he hasn't believed in the name of the only son of God. Whoever doesn't believe stands condemned. What this means is Jesus didn't come into the world to be like, okay, I'm sending you to hell, I'm sending you to hell, I'm sending you to hell. Everybody was already headed that way. Everybody was stood condemned already. Jesus came to save, and that's why we go with that same message that Jesus is the hope for those who believe. Whoever doesn't believe stands condemned, but whoever believes in Jesus is saved. So if you think about these two questions, the first one being pluralism. Are there many ways to God? Let's put up this bullseye. The idea that there can be many ways to God, the nature of truth, does not allow pluralism. That's not the way truth acts. And we think about this idea of inclusivism. That's the idea that Jesus' death includes all people, no matter what they believe. Well, the teachings of the Bible don't allow that. So the nature of truth doesn't allow many ways to God. The teaching of the Bible don't allow uh, inclusivism. That leaves you with the answer that Jesus is the only way. Faith in Jesus is the only way. Jesus' claims are exclusive, just like truth. He claims to be deity. He claims to be God. No other founder claims that. He claims that he not only knows the path, but he is the path. He's the only founder whose miracles are reported in the earliest sources. He called his shot. He taught ahead of time, I'm going to die for people's sins, and then he did it. And he taught, I'm going to raise from the dead, and he did it. Jesus' claims are different from every other religious teacher. You think even about people who, who uh, discredit Christianity and say, I don't believe. Here's a question for those, those guys is, what do you do with the resurrection? There's so much proof for the resurrection of the dead. Zach's going to teach a breakout on it later this week. What do you do with the resurrection? Now, when we talk about this, that Jesus is the only way, that Jesus is the truth, there's always been a call for the people of God to turn away from false gods to worship him alone. This isn't narrow-minded. This is the way the truth works, right? Uh, what we're not calling people to, uh, you know, like with, we're not calling people to our preference, 
as in, hey, my, my favorite food is fried chicken, and all y'all should convert and become fried chicken lovers with me. Come on. And if you don't like fried chicken, you're wrong. Oh, that'd be stupid because that's just my preference. We're not saying Christianity is my favorite religion, and you should, you should come on, do it with me. And this is different. This isn't preference. This is truth. And the most loving thing for us to do is to tell people the truth. We're not converting people to our preference. We're we're trying to tell people the truth, which is loving. The beauty of Christianity is that it's exclusive, meaning it's narrow because it's true, and it's inclusive, meaning it includes, I I mean, salvation's a free gift. Salvation is through Jesus alone, but it's open to all. It's free. It's a gift. Christianity is beautiful because it's exclusive. It's truthful because it's exclusive. But it's, it's beautiful and graceful because it's inclusive. Jesus is the author that actually entered into the story to, to reveal himself to us. And based on the nature of truth and the teachings of Scripture, Jesus is the only way. Let's pray. Lord, I know this is a difficult subject to tackle, particularly after sitting through another session. God, I pray that your truth would penetrate our hearts and our emotions, that, they, that your truth would penetrate our minds. I pray that we would, we would see the nature of truth that you've put into creation, that we would bank on 2 plus 2 equals 4, and we would see the way that truth operates, that there can't be multiple ways to you, but that Christianity makes the most sense of the world around us, that your death is exclusive in that salvation is only through you, but it's inclusive in that you invite all people to yourself, God, and I pray that we would preach this truth because it's the loving thing to do. Jesus, I pray that you prep us to hear uh, your message tonight, and we love you. In your name we pray. Amen.